Hey team, okay, welcome to your screencast on cellular energy and chemiosmosis. Uh, this one, I'm gonna try to keep it really short, so here we go, let's get to it. So, um, we have studied in the past already fats, oops, this is too small, um, fats and lipids, as well as carbohydrates. This fat specifically is a triglyceride. I'm not going to write that down, but you should. And this is a long-term energy storage molecule. Again, write that down. I'm not going to. Um, and the, the, the energy that's stored within this molecule is actually within the carbon-carbon bonds. So carbon-carbon, oops, carbon-carbon bonds contain the chemical energy And when we break those bonds apart, the energy is released. The same is true for carbs. Although there are more of a short-term energy storage molecule. This is glucose. I'm not going to write that down, but you should. In its linear structure as well as its ring structure, again, you should write that down. I'm not going to. But the same thing is true here, that these carbon-carbon bonds that we see in the molecule are storing the chemical energy of the molecule. Um, and when we break that, those bonds, the chemical energy is released. And while we use fats and carbohydrates for long-term and short-term energy storage, both of these two things are converted to chemical energy in another form. ATP to be used by the cell. Um, and ATP is uh, kind of the, the energy currency of the cell. It's uh, just like we use dollars in the United States, but if you went to Europe, you would use euros. Um, the form of energy that the cell uh, spends is in the form of ATP. Um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It is adenosine, which, as you might remember, is of the nucleotide uh, A from um, DNA, but it doesn't have a sugar group. Now it's just the nitrogenous base, adenosine. Um, so this, this uh, adenosine group and then three phosphate groups stuck together. Um, ATP... Uh, the way that it stores energy is much like um, fats and carbohydrates, which store the energy in these carbon-carbon bonds. Um, the energy here is stored between these phosphate groups that are bound to the adenosine. And so energy is released when we break off a phosphate from the ATP molecule. So this is adenosine triphosphate because it has three phosphate groups becomes ADP or adenosine diphosphate when we break off a phosphate group. And in that process, energy is released. Um, why do we care about this? Well, this is the way that all kind of chemical processes in our body uh, move forward, or, or maybe I shouldn't say all, but many of them. So for example, anytime you contract a muscle, like right now when you're picking up your pencil to write something down, Muscle contraction is because ATP comes and binds to this myosin motor protein, um, which then um, interacts with a um, cytoskeleton component called um, actin, and the hydrolysis of uh, ATP into uh, ADP and phosphate, um, free phosphate, causes the motor protein to um, move. Um, this is called the, the power stroke. Um, so the energy that uh, causes this motor protein to move is because ATP is broken up into adenosine and free phosphate. Um, in addition to that, we've talked about active transport When you're moving a molecule against its concentration gradient, often the energy for that is provided by ATP. 
ATP comes and drops off a phosphate, and then when the phosphate is cleaved off of the protein, the um, solute particle is pushed through the pump. So once again, we spend some ATP and we get out ATP and phosphate. And then another, uh, the last example that we're gonna talk about today about how we spend ATP is when we have um, an endothermic reaction. We can couple this endothermic reaction with the splitting of ATP into ADP and free phosphate in order to power that reaction. So imagine we have a situation where our reactants have um, less energy than the final products. Well, we need to put energy into this reaction in order to get it to take place. Um, it's not going to happen spontaneously like it could if the products had more energy than the reactions, if the energy was released in the process. But if this um, process requires energy, then the difference between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products will be provided by ATP. So ATP can be used to get this reaction to occur. Um, okay, so these are a few examples of ATP um, and how it's used in uh, cells. Um, but how do we make ATP? How do we go uh, from fats and carbohydrates to making ATP? Well, we're going to talk about that extensively in the coming weeks when we talk about the process of cellular respiration. Um, but I want to just give a brief kind of connection to the thing that we just studied um, to this idea of making ATP by introducing the idea of chemiosmosis. So I said before that the bonds in these molecules, um, uh, so the association of um, these atoms and the interaction between their electrons is what's storing the chemical energy um, in these molecules. Um, chemiosmosis is another way to store and then spend energy. And osmosis we discussed is the movement of um, water through a membrane. And chemiosmosis is going to be similar to that, but it's slightly different, is that the movement of ions ions across a semi permeable membrane down their concentration gradient C O N C E N down their concentration gradient. Okay, so before I introduce this idea of chemiosmosis as how it relates to a cell, I'm going to relate it to something maybe that you've already experienced in your life or maybe at least have a little knowledge of. And that's the idea of a hydroelectric dam. So a dam works by taking a river, um, which is flowing uh, from somewhere to uh, an area of uh, lower potential energy, um, usually the ocean, um, and damming it up, preventing the water from flowing. So we get this big mass uh, or body of water above the dam, um, which is an area of high potential energy. And then we have an area down below of low potential energy, but high kinetic energy. I'm just going to say high. Um, if the water was allowed to flow uh, through the dam unimpeded, it would have high potential energy up here, and then it would have high kinetic energy down here. It would be moving quickly as its potential energy was converted to kinetic energy. Um, but if we put 
some sort of turbine in the middle of the dam, then water flowing through the dam um, will cause the turbine to spin or to rotate. And if we embed this turbine um, within a um, magnet, basically if we take a bunch of magnets and we get them to spin around, um, we can, when we, when we have a moving magnetic field, that induces a moving electric charge. Uh, this is what's called a generator. If you want to learn more about this, you should take electronics and programming. So um, spinning the turbine will create a current, and then that current can be sent uh, through the power grid and used to light up the power or the lights in your house. Um, so we've taken um, water, something with high potential energy here, and we have converted that to electrical energy here. Um, the same thing can happen with a concentration gradient. Um, so for example, if you have on one side of a membrane an area of a high concentration of hydrogen relative to the other side of a membrane where you have a low concentration of hydrogen, this is like an area of high potential energy relative to this area over here. And hydrogen is gonna wanna flow down its concentration gradient. But as you know, a hydrogen ion is a charged um, atom and it can't just move directly through the membrane through diffusion because of this hydrophobic nonpolar interior of the membrane. Because hydrogen is charged, it's not going to be able to move directly through the membrane. It needs to have some sort of facilitated um, help to cross the membrane in the form of a protein channel. Um, but hydrogen is like, there's, there's a pressure wanting to push it through this protein. Um, and this protein actually has a specific name. It's called ATP synthase. And yes, you guessed it, it is the enzyme that creates ATP from ADP and phosphate. So what happens is that as hydrogen is allowed to flow through the molecule or through this protein channel down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to low, it causes this enzyme to spin. And that kinetic energy can be used to form a bond between um, ADP and free phosphate to form ATP. And that's how ATP is made. Um, so chemiosmosis is another way for a cell to um, transform energy from one form to another and store energy in the cell. So not only can energy be stored in the form of bonds between atoms, but it can also be stored in the form of chemical gradients. Um, okay, so that's more on chemiosmosis coming up. We're gonna see it in both the processes of cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And it's kind of a linkage between what we studied previously, which was um, organic molecules to uh, what we just finished talking about, which was movement of molecules across membranes, and what we're going to study next, which is the creation of ATP uh, from carbs and fats through the process of cellular respiration. Okay, hopefully this was relatively short. See you all tomorrow. Bye!